Good afternoon. My name is Brendan Ahern. I'm the Chief Investment Officer of Crane Shares Exchange Traded Funds. I'm excited to introduce today's webinar, uh, Case Buy, an overview of HedgeEye's proprietary risk range signals and a new ETF to help manage risk in U.S. equities. I'm really excited to be at HedgeEye Risk Management's headquarters, uh, joined by CEO and founder Keith McCall, as well as HedgeEye Asset Management's Chief Investment Officer, John McNamara. <laughs> uh, but I think what gets me really excited is not only just the timing of uh, the latest ETF from Crane Shares, uh, just I think in terms of what's happening in terms of U.S. equities, really excited to get some of Keith's thoughts on the timing of this launch. I think it was quite, uh, quite timely on our part. Um, at the same time, what really attracted Crane Shares to implementing a Hedgeye vehicle, uh, really based on their research, was their process. And I think that's something that Crane Shares, we take a lot of pride on having a really a dedicated process. Uh, for those of you less familiar about Crane Shares, we uh, really the roots of the firm are around our founder, Jonathan Crane, the time he spent living in China, uh, where he saw the rise of the new China economic sectors as well as the opening of China's financial markets. And Jonathan so believed in what he saw happening in China that when he came back here to the United States, he founded Crane Shares, uh, our flagship fund, our Crane Shares CSI China Internet ETF is now the second largest China ETF outside of China. Um, but certainly the most important thing we do, very similar to I think the Hedgeye risk process is providing a focus on data, no emotions. Um, every day I write uh, our China Last Night research blog, uh, which wants to provide a data-driven perspective on what's happening in China. Very similar to what my colleague Luke Oliver does with our climate business, with our carbon credit allowance futures, as well as our partners such as Nancy Davis at Quadratic or Mount Lucas on the managed future side. You fast forward today, uh, after 11 years, we have a whole suite of exchange-traded funds uh, focused on China, climate, as well as alternatives. And I think the timing of this latest launch on KSPY is just absolutely fantastic. Now, now I just told you a little bit about, about who Crane shares are, but I know some of you might not be as familiar with Hedgeye risk management. And, uh, you know, it's just great to be here, Keith. It's, uh, you know, but I think for those of who may be less familiar, I always like to say, like, who are you? How'd you get here? Um, you, know, you know, what what is Hedgeye all about? Yeah, well, I used to run this show called The Macro Show, but now I'm going to have Brendan run it. Yeah. A... <laughs> <laughs> I, I think your job's safe. <laughs> no, I, I appreciate that. And I do think we can get into the timing uh, yeah, of it yeah. all. Um, Obviously, when you're coming off of a market, what I think could be a market top, that's that's a good time to, to be risk managing things. Uh, just some background, I you know, basically spent the first uh, part of my career on the buy side as both an analyst and then ultimately a hedge fund manager of my own fund. So everything that I've baked into the cake or everything I've ever created is is built by me. Uh, and and with the support, of course, of my teammates and modern tools like AI, which is making things quite interesting. But again, I've always been quantitatively oriented and mathematical in my approach. I got into fractal math probably early compared to, to most. And the, the, the signals that, that, I, that, I, that I started to build weren't, weren't the kind of linear signals or the simple moving averages of things that people think work. Now, they may have worked uh, in a certain day and age, but they certainly don't work now. If they worked, we would use them. Um, but I really you know, spent that, you know, the, it's, it's really just like living inside of your own P&L all the time. You have to get it right. So if you don't have a signal that's right, you have to change your signal and you have to continue to work on your craft. Now, the game has changed quite a bit. You know, when I was in the hedge fund uh, business, I ended up at Carlisle. I got to see a uh, gargantuan blow up of a hedge fund. I didn't blow it up myself, but I was there. Uh, and you, you, get to, you, get to, you get to know what not to do, okay? So those moving averages are not risk management. Um, Theme-based kind of, uh, well, this could happen in the world, therefore I'm gonna manage risk today. Uh, or today's more modern, you know, macro tourism, which is, oh, t today I'm going to Japan. I'm going to be the Japanese yen carry trade expert. That doesn't, um, that doesn't work. And what works is a repeatable process, a, a consistent lens. So when I look at a market, what I see is very different than what most other people are going to see in the market because I'm using my own signal. 
So to spend, you know, some should I spend some time on that? Like I, how we, yeah, I, yeah. Um, you know, the the most basic relationships embedded in in my model and my signal uh, is multi-factor in in nature and multi-duration. So what I mean by multi-factor, I use I don't use a simple moving average of price. That would be a one-factor model, not a multi-factor model. Multi-factor. Let's just start with three: price, volume, and volatility, and the rates of change of those three things and how they interact with each other. So now you're going to start, like the way I thought about it, just like any fractal pattern, is there emergent properties inside of the signal and there are sim similar sets, et cetera. And it gives birth to these patterns, these patterns that are self-perpetuating. What's interesting now, if that sounds like a mouthful, that's, that's what the signal is. I mean, to the, I'm not going to just hand over the algorithm uh, today or anything like that. But in terms of its actual construction, it's really important um, to be consistent. So when I look at, when I say multi-duration, we have our immediate term trade duration, three weeks or less. We can show a slide on that. I think it's slide nine in our own deck. Um, trades, trends, uh, trends are, are three months or more. And then long-term tails, three years or less. So we don't start, you know, our, our risk management doesn't start with what's going to happen three years from now. It doesn't say what's going to happen three months from now. It's what is happening in that signal right now relative to what it's been doing. Okay, so once I got to that, that, that really solved for a lot of things. So I created the risk range, you know, the risk range signal and those three durations, which are levels, the risk range signal ticks in real time. So I could give you the new risk range for every millisecond of trading if I wanted, but that would drive me crazy and you too. But what I'm really trying to do is be very consistent if I'm looking at gold or if I'm looking at uh, SPY or if I'm looking at a, a single stock in terms of how I'm interpreting what the, the market and, and the modern machine, which is super important, uh, is interpreting about that price, volume, and volatility action. What you find is if you get a breakout in volatility in rate of change terms, things blow up, okay? So if the price is going down, the volume's going up, and the volatility is breaking out on, a, on my trend signal, that's like a get out signal, which we made most recently. It's called also running it fundamentally with our quad four uh, analysis makes it made it quite valuable and timely uh, to, to Brendan's point in terms of where we're at, at, at on, 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 you know, at this juncture of the game. It's not always going to be that way. I mean, uh, for a long time, like our signal was trend bullish on, on SPY, for example. So you'd be a buyer of all dips. Um, now it's a seller of all rips. So, you know, that can change. But the decisions that I make 100 percent of the time have to do with what that risk range is on my screen that I can only, you know, again, I have analysts that can calculate alongside me, of course, but we do not give that code away. We give the output away. Mm. So again, that's, yeah. you know, essentially, you know, the foundation or the background to, uh, short version of background yeah. to foundation to where we're at today. Yeah, yeah, and now, now the the product that, you know, we're, you know, Crane Shares has launched case by, it takes that, that, that element of your risk range work, but that, that's part of a bigger framework and, you know, hedge eye risk management, there's obviously a heavy emphasis of, you know, maybe talking a little bit about, you know, who are your end clients on your macro research, yep. but but there's there's a lot more to hedge eye risk management. You know, uh, you've got stock analysts here that, you know, are doing a lot of great bottom up fundamental work. Uh, but then also you're you're working increasingly with financial advisors, wealth managers. So so you could just take a minute, like, how do different people utilize hedge eye risk management? Because you, you do a, uh, a number of different things, and they're all they're all kind of you got this intel inside, right? This this core framework. But then, how do you parse that out to these different types of investors, who, you know, from hedge funds, sovereign wealth, to financial advisors, individual investors? Yeah, I mean, it, since since it's a an independent research platform, like we don't have a broker dealer, we don't have an investment bank, we don't have a trading desk, so we can't sell you any of those things. The only thing that we can sell you is Edge, Research Edge. Actually, our holding company is called Research Edge. If it's not Edge, it won't sell. So you know, you can think of it institutionally. Our our global macro you know, risk management product, which analyzes 50 different countries across all these, yeah. you know, anything that ticks essentially. You know, pension funds, mutual funds, um, family offices, increasingly mm -hmm. interested in that yeah. because we're their north star. From like, okay, it's one thing to be worried about inflation. It's another thing to have. Uh, a live nowcast, which is again also algorithmic, that tells you where inflation's ticking where, and where mm -hmm. U.S. growth or GDP is ticking up and down. So we have, you know, institutional clients will pay either for you know a la carte for macro research, for yep. example, or they'll say, well, all I care about is your healthcare research vertical. Yeah, yeah. So for again, and we have, 
you know, again, we, we have, um, uh, I think we have 12 sector heads now. They're, 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 they're all their good looking faces. So again, um, when you put it all together, I mean, we have like to your point, we have like a lot of research independent coming from top down macro, yeah. quantitative signaling, we have our whole new AI initiative, which is just purely AI-based signals, yeah. um, which is not what the case by is. But again, um, we're trying to bring to life the things that, that's the whole notion of hedge eye. Mm -hmm. I was a hedge fund analyst, a hedge fund manager. I know what hedge funds need, I know what they do, I know what best practices are, and I know what not to do, uh, at least for now. And, uh, <laughs> but we, you know, hedge eye, the whole, the name, is like if you could look inside a hedge yeah. fund, what would you see them doing? And what you would see is is part you know, mostly what I just described. Yeah, and I think I think what's kind of exciting is we're taking a piece of that research yep. and making it investable, but then also you know taking something that might be hard for people to do. That you know there's a lot of things as a long only manager or financial advisor or mutual. You know, you you, 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 have, you maybe aren't able to do option strategies. You you probably can't short or use margin yep. or futures in that. So I think what's exciting about about K Spy is that it takes something that would be really almost impossible for a lot of investors out there to incorporate themselves, but then also to be able to do it on a scalable way. Yeah, that I mean, and there's you know there's um, there's a lot to a lot of people using a tool like that. Yeah. Right. So think about it. I have hundreds and hundreds of institutional accounts, thousands and thousands, ten, you can go to like tens of thousands, depending on the day, of viewers and those who are actually using the risk range product. The risk range product, again, it's not just spy on that risk range product. We have, like I said, everything from the 10-year bond yield to, mm -hmm. to gold to uh, the mega caps or the, the, the mag sevens. You know, when mo a lot, of, uh, when a growing number of people execute at the top end of the range, when they're like, oh, we're at the top end of the range, we're going to sell. And there are that many people that understand that that's what they should do and that's what mm -hmm. they do, then it's almost, it's become a little bit more self-perpetuating. I can't like define any other reason why the signals become more accurate. You know, when you're at the low end of the range, you buy. When you're at the top end of the range, you sell. Yeah. Now, I don't know why we're so differentiated in saying buy low, sell high, but the modern day, <laughs> the, the, the modern day, you know, especially new investor, post-pandemic thinks that you it's YOLO. Like if it's up, you right. chase it. And if it's down, you just sell it. Yeah. You know, so it's really this self-governing, like our community is actually perpetuated, I think. You know, I, I can't think of like one more reason why the, the signals become more accurate than the increased participation of those who understand what to do at the top end of the risk range in the S&P 500. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's interesting. And yeah. It, yeah. No, no, I just was going to say, obviously, there's a lot coming out of, uh, of Hedgeye, as, as Keith just alluded to. And, uh, you know, uh, my job as, as CIO of Hedgeye Asset Management is to take that intellectual property and, and turn it into um, um, products. And, you know, I think a, a phrase that Keith likes to use a lot is, is a better way. I think, you know, what we're trying to produce here is, is uh, tools, you know, that enable investors to, um, you know, access markets in, in, in a better way. Um, and I think, you know, uh, our first foray into mm -hmm. that is, uh, you know, the Hedge Eye Hedged Equity Index, uh, which Crane Shares is exclusively licensing, uh, which utilizes, uh, you know, the risk ranges to um, effectively implement uh, a hedged equity strategy. Um, you know, we, we view this as mm -hmm. being a, a very differentiated product versus, um, you know, the incumbents in the market um, in that, uh, you know, we're utilizing the risk ranges. Um, we're utilizing um, three separate option strategies that are very unique. Um, and you know, with the product being index-based, it's fully systematic, which um, you know, I think is, is another uh, differentiated factor. Maybe I'll just dive into you know, the way yeah. that the, the index works um, and, you know, and you know, how, it, how, it, how it trades. Uh, I think if you jump to slide 11, Eric. Um, so basically, the, the, the product operates in uh, three regimes. I, I like to refer to them as, um, you know, the typical uh, incumbent hedged equity product uh, is basically always operating in the within regime, uh, which is basically a put spread collar. Uh, you're selling a call to buy a put spread. Um, you know, even in this particular vertical, we have a, a, a significant differentiation in that, um, you know, the, the strikes that we're choosing for our options positions in this environment are based upon the risk ranges, which I think as Keith just alluded to, are, are quite unique um, and obviously uh, valuable. I think, uh, Eric, if you jump back one slide, I think 
83% uh, of the time, this just kind of speaks to the efficacy that Keith alluded to of the risk ranges, 83% of the time the S&P 500 closes within uh, the daily published risk range, uh, and that's back to since they began publishing them in um, 2015. Uh, we jump ahead again, uh, so where, where things really start to get differentiated with this product uh, are in the, the other two regimes, which are uh, the above and the below regime. So when we're above the top end of the risk range, like Keith alluded to, you want to be you know, selling, uh, selling you know, aggressively. Uh, you know, we, we really view that as being a very high conviction environment um, where you know, we're expecting a fairly immediate uh, term um, you know, decline in, in price. So uh, you know, during that regime, we don't sell uh, you know, the lower end of the put spread. So you're basically just short a call and long a put. Obviously, you're long the S&P 500 as well. Uh, but, you know, this, this obviously is a very high conviction environment, and that's why, uh, you know, we're, we're deploying that particular strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, similarly, uh, in the uh, below risk range uh, environment, uh, you know, we're looking for a fairly immediate increase in the S&P 500. So, you know, we still want to maintain a constant level of hedging in this product. Uh, but in that environment, we don't deploy uh, the short call strategy, um, and you know that's because this is basically mm -hmm. again a very high conviction environment. We don't want to be short that call. However, we still want to be hedged. Yeah. Um, so you know that's that's a quick overview of, of of the regimes of the product. Yeah. So so I mean so you basically have you know the S and P five hundred is I think it's about like two thirds of global market cap. I'm surprised uh, it's not more. <laughs> well, you know, actually next Tuesday is MSCI's uh, <laughs> pro forma for the big rebalance. So it, it actually could go up just based on U.S. markets going up, non-U.S. going down. It, it actually could be higher. Wow. And I think that's part of why I'm excited about this product because you haven't, you know, since the GFC low, the S&P's up 1,000% just about. Um, and so just, just owning S&P 500, that's, you know, just... Buy it, you know. Buy the S and P five hundred. Walk away, right? It's it's just been all reward, and and I think we're entering a regime where there's going to be some more risk. It doesn't mean U S stocks can't go up, but you basically, you know, case by utilizing options around the hedge eye risk ranges, you're basically trying to kind of mitigate, you know, some of the some of the volatility, like give some people some protection while maintaining upside. Is is that kind of a fair assessment of? Like if I'm thinking about how am I going to put this to work, like, you know, it's it's to me it's almost like sharp ratios should start to matter again, right? Yeah. It's been all return, no one ever thinks about risk, and I think in the last two weeks, really since we launched, people are thinking a lot more about risk. <laughs> well, yeah. And so here's kind of a way to embed some risk management, even though I might have a long-term view around holding U.S. stocks. Yeah, and I think look, um, you know, Keith and I. <laughs> Talk, talk fairly regularly, and I think re recently we were discussing that, you know, how we're both old enough to remember what happened in 2022, <laughs> you know, back when the VIX was at levels that it's at currently. Uh, I don't remember that being a particularly uh, great time to be deploying uh, long-only capital, but, you know, I, I think what we're looking to do here is, you know, in a systematic manner, uh, provide, you know, downside risk management and volatility reduction, you know, for individuals, uh, you know, or utilizers of our index, um, you know, who, who want to continue to maintain that uh, upside potential in the S&P mm -hmm. 500. Okay. Yeah, and that's kind of case by takes the hedge eye asset management index, makes it investable. So it's, in, you know, we're basically holding S&P 500 and then overlaying these option strategies based on the risk ranges. And so again, I think, you know, I know Keith, you've been pretty vocal about what's been happening uh, over the last few weeks in terms of uh, some of the, your proprietary measures or kind of flashing red it feels like you know i think um you know as students of the hedge eye risk management process and as a, a consumer of your research it's been fun to watch that you know I, I thought you know some of your calls i mean not not to inflate your ego but you've made some <laughs> really good calls i mean uh i think you, you you went short u.s tech about you know a week ago today or maybe uh, eight days ago i mean just unbelievable i mean what what's changed where you've kind of changed your outlook in terms of uh, risk assets, you know, it's like U.S. equities. Well, I mean, thanks for that. I mean, I, I dialed up the market gods before the case file. <laughs> yeah, yeah. said, let's, uh, let's put the S&P top in right here. Uh, uh, kidding, obviously, but the, 
you know, when we look at economies, we think of them in terms of like you're in one of four quadrants. You guys can show the quad map if, if you'd like on slide six of the slide deck. Uh, what happened, Brennan, was the data started to slow. So we went to quad four. That's why you see that diving into the left yeah. uh, bottom corner of the economic data. There were 11 data points out of, the, uh, out of the 13 in July that were released in the U.S. economic data that slowed. And when they're going to slow further, uh, not to get into the, the math of it all, but the base effects are steepening because last July, if you remember, everything from Barbenheimer to Swift tickets to Beyonce and back again, I mean, it was a, a AI yeah. euphoria. Yeah. I mean, it's an extremely difficult economic comparison and the data is slowing into it. So think of it mm -hmm. like the comparison is the mountain, you know, the base effects, and now you have to run faster just to stay, you know, stay on pace. And, and the data is just saying, no, you're slowing down. So we call that quad four. So okay. we went from raging bulls in quad two, which is when growth and inflation are accelerating at the same time, so are corporate profits, to now both growth and inflation are slowing at the same time. Okay. And we're seeing the commensurate like guide downs of big companies, because that's, that's why we use it. If, mm -hmm. you could, if you could know which way the wind blows, and we call them the quads, uh, then you're going to know how the companies are feeling the wind. Mm -hmm. right? So a company like Amazon blows up, you know, big companies. They're saying Google says we're slowing. Uh, you know, Microsoft stopped accelerating. Mm -hmm. so, so all those, that's why we made a negative call on tech because, again, the signal was front running that economic data anyway. So again, that's the whole point of the risk range process. I'm yeah. like, wow, this is getting, you know, I always say risk happens slowly and then all at once. Yeah, yeah. And, and we've had some all at once days that we haven't seen in, in you know, since 2020. Yeah. And that's the, when you see more of those, what you're really seeing is that PVV model, price volume volatility model really blow out. Okay. You're seeing people, you know, more people have to sell on accelerating volatility. Again, people have to sell when volatility does something differently, yep. uh, or they really want to buy when volatility just keeps going down, mm -hmm. which, was the, which was the regime of volatility we were in mm -hmm. because we were in a positive economic you know, scenario. We're running 3% GDP up until you know, the, the end of the second quarter, yeah, yeah. Which, which is a very high level of GDP. Yeah. Um, and there are a lot of reasons for that, but it's really just calling what we call a quad shift yeah. out of quad two, which is nirvana, to quad four. Okay, and you know, um, again, uh, you know, as a paid research subscriber, but also like it's trying to understand, you know, you, you put up a lot of great educational information on, on the Hedgeye website for free. I give you, you know, a lot of credit. That Thank you. You're, uh, but you've referenced these kind of economic regimes that you, you know, you reference as quads. So you have these different quads, one, two, three, but you know, how, you know, so can you kind of maybe just for those who are less familiar with like the quads that these economic yep. regimes like, because you actually have, you have this great chart right on that you give away for free, right? Of like, you know, here, here's what usually works. Yeah. Uh, but then you're actually applying that to every market globally. Yes. So on, on slide seven, which, this is going to bleed your eyes out. I'll do it for one second. It's not a magic <laughs> trick. Th those are all the back test quarterly returns by asset class, factor exposure, anything that ticks. In English, the next slide, you can see what I think Brendan's alluding yes, to, yeah, exactly. which is what works in each quad. So you can see in quad four, where th th in this case, we have some disinflation, not deflation. You know, I want to be long bonds, fixed income, and gold. Those are my two biggest positions. Uh, I want to get out of commodities. I want to get out of tech as you go down the sector styles. You want to get out of uh, industrials. You want to get out of Amazon consumer discretionary. And you want to get long utilities. So we're long utilities, uh, REITs, healthcare stocks. Okay. You know, so we use that. You know, if the market's not doing that, the economy's not doing that. Yeah. So the two factors are, again, growth. What is the rate of change of GDP growth? And what is the rate of change of inflation? Those two things, again, uh, are they accelerating or decelerating? And that's it. It's not, are they good, are they bad? You know, is it cheap, is it expensive? And what you find is that uh, cheap gets really cheap when you're in quad four, and expensive gets really expensive in quad two. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what happened. I mean, when NVIDIA was at 135 bucks, you know, we were in quad two. Mm -hmm. Now NVIDIA is going towards 95 bucks, and we're in quad four. So. <laughs> yeah. Hello. Uh, <laughs> yeah, here, yeah, here we are. But even with making those turns, though, and, and just to bring this back to the risk ranges, you know, like you didn't just start getting long those exposures that benefit from you know the quad four setup, you know, last week. No. Like the signal was front running the quad, and you know the signal is the risk ranges, and yeah. you know that's getting you set up, and you know that's why, in my opinion, these things are so valuable. And why you know I wanted to create something that where you know we were utilizing it. Yeah, when the most important thing is when something goes from bullish 
or from bullish trend to bearish trend, that's tech, mm -hmm. uh, or conversely from bearish trend to bullish trend, that's utilities, that's gold. And those things, to your point, had been happening well before making the call to Short tech is a glossy one, right? People are like, wow, how, how could you do that? I mean, well, well, we, we do it every time we hit quad four. We did it in 2022, we did it in 2020, we did it in 2018, we did it in, uh, in two, we started the firm in 2008. Okay. Um, so we do have a long history, you know, of calling, you know, we founded the firm on calling the stock market crash of 2008. We went bullish in April of 09. We're not perma bulls, mm -hmm. perma bears. We're permanently risk managing uh, inside, you know, using the risk range. Think of the risk range as like, when you get up in the morning, at least when I get up in the morning, you know, when you turn the light on, that's it's my light. Right? I, I cannot see anything unless I look at that risk range. I will never make a decision to you know, allocate assets to something or take them out of something without looking at that first. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I think that's what's, uh, you know, again, I think we go back to a period where over the last 15 years, you know, you know just a thousand percent. I mean, it's, a, you know. But all of a sudden, if we have this regime change taking place from an economic perspective and the effect on markets, having this risk control in your U.S. equity exposure is, is how I've been thinking about it, like, you know, about utilizing myself as a shareholder. Um, but, you know, we've, we've actually been pretty active in terms of moving the option strategies with the, around our S&P 500 exposure since we launched, John. You know, what's... Yeah. What you know? What's changed? I mean, even though we're you know we're in a situation where, you know, the quad four we're kind of flashing red, we're maintaining this equity exposure, but we're actually still making some changes just based on where where the market is within this range. Is that accurate? Yeah, yeah. Well, look, I think uh, you know Keith likes to say all the time, it's just math. I mean, it's just math, um, and you know, it's just the risk range. Um, you know, the risk range changes every day. The mm -hmm. price of the S and P five hundred changes every day. Um, you know. When we're you know switching those regimes, you know we're switching our options positions. So yeah, I mean even since we've started, I think we've changed uh, you know the options positions um, in in the index uh, four times. Obviously, um, you know I think we've either been in the within or the or the below regime. I think um, uh, recently uh, we got into the below regime for back to back days, which okay. uh, is a pretty unique setup. Um, so you know obviously expecting to to see a bounce in the S and P five hundred, which I think you know. We then saw, but you know, obviously maintaining that hedge, uh, which you know is so important for what we're trying to do with regard to uh, you know reducing the volatility uh, and providing that downside protection. Yeah, and I know Nick on slide 16 we show that uh, you know this strategy it, it is an index uh, that we're making investable, but but it's 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 very it, I mean it's it's adaptive, and I think that what's interesting is that we've seen the. Um, option exposure change based on where the S and P 500 with, is within this risk range, and so we've been, uh, you know, we've had, you know, knock on wood, we've had some really nice performance uh, relative to just naked um, U.S. equity exposure that we've really outperformed in a really difficult, which is really what the, I think is really the point of the product is to give you that risk-adjusted return, something that. People have really forgotten about in this risk, completely risk on market for 15 years. And you know, we've changed some of these exposures um, and, and to, you know, to, to the, you know, the whole team's credit. I mean, it's been something really fun to watch. And as an investor, you know, thank you for protecting my family's capital <laughs> in a pretty tough, tough time period. Now, you know, one thing I've been thinking a lot about, Keith, is, you know, as a, you know, someone who's been invested, you know, you know, my background has been in the ETF world, you know, you know, a long time. You know, I've got some of these positions that, you know, are up a lot. And, you know, like most people, you, I, I don't want to pay taxes. Um, and yet I don't want to give it away, right? You know, I don't want to lose some of that upside. And so the way I've been kind of thinking about it for myself and my own personal account, you know, even for some of my kids and their, their little custodial accounts and stuff, you know, is maybe maybe that new that new dollar going in. I, I put it into something like Case Buy, which is going to give me that 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 exposure. I mean, when you talk to your investor base, how like how are they talking to you about you know their views of the market and is is this kind of idea of risk management coming back? Is that is that something that you're seeing institutionally? Yeah, yeah I mean, volatility was shot for dead. So when you get a breakout in volatility, people start getting shot, and they're, yeah. they're shot at, and that's what they feel like. Like I'd, I'd say that 
certain days, those two days when you're below the low end of the risk range, um, there was a little more of a panic, I, I think, to kind of emotion, in, emotion, <laughs> panic, client questions like, you know, because we get institutional questions yeah. through email, phone calls, et cetera. And I'm like, look, dude, just chill out. I mean, it's below the low end of the risk range, cover some shorts. And when it's the top, the top end of the range at a big lower high, that's an important concept. And we've seen this come through. The risk range used to be, the top end of the range used to be close to 5,700. Right, and by the way, this this you know the strategy works in the up market too. It just doesn't yeah. make you chase the highs and and sell the lows, exactly. right? So uh, it's not like it's just some you know thing that outperforms in a down market. Now we'll see because it launched in July, right? I mean, yeah. um, but yeah, the you know when I when I when I look at it's doing its job. I mean, now the top end of the risk range. I mean, this morning was at fifty three seventy six. I mean, it's come it's come in you know over three hundred S and P yeah, yeah. five hundred handles. Yeah, and I, I think which is a tremendous and, amount. Yeah, <laughs> and in that environment, it's very easy to you know get emotional. Right. Uh, which you know the index is purely systematic. There's no you know tinkering or anything like that. I mean, it's just you know unemotional, systematic. You know, it's not calling Keith and saying, "Hey, what's going on?" No, exactly. <laughs> well, I mean, today today's a good example. I, I don't know what the S and P five hundred is up, but it was up at one point two percent or more. Um, so a typical person would be, well, I don't want to miss this move. Maybe I should get in here. Mm. Well, if not, if you get closer to the top end of the range, that's where that's where we'd be a seller. Yeah. And it worked really well yesterday because you know the market opened up and then closed on its lows. So, in a developing bear market or at least a bearish trend, like the S and P just had an eight percent drawdown, almost nine percent. The Nasdaq was down uh, almost fourteen percent from yeah, yeah. where it was in July. Yep. I mean, you know, can you take that? Do you think that that's it? Do you have to believe that that's it? We don't have to believe anything. We're, we, we, if the risk range is is bullish trend, we, you know, we know what to do with that. If it's bearish trend, we know what to do with that. But most importantly, in either a bull or bear market, we know what to do at the top and at the bottom end of the range. Mm -hmm. And it's systematic, like John said. Like there's no, when I execute in my long short book or in my long only, like my family office account, um, I don't debate. I just, you know, I'm just on my numlock pad, just reloading, reloading, what, what's the, where's the range? Yeah. And, and it's just a mathematical equation that is, it's changed my life because you know, I used to be one of these crackhead hedge fund people that just <laughs> flying around, you know, just, I don't know what's going on here. And it's like, you know, it's like you're trying to, you know, volatility drive, can you drive you crazy. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and I, I, think, I think, you know, that element of on a daily basis, you're making these adjustments, it's getting incorporated in the ETF. Like, I just think that's really hard, you know, for as a financial advisor or even as an individual or, um, it'd just be really hard to incorporate that, you know, that daily grind that you're doing, getting up at 4.30 in the morning and, you know, all of that work gets incorporated in the index and then we're implementing it in case by. I just think, I think it would be really hard for someone as a financial advisor, as an individual investor to, to be that on top of, you know, the daily trading um, and that, that's basically what you're hiring us to do, I mm -hmm. think, with Case Spy. Well, Brendan, I mean, I wouldn't just say that. I mean, it's very, it's very hard for the world's largest hedge fund manager yeah. to do. That's why they use it. Yeah. Like, right? it's not like the number one question I get asked by people. I'm not going to use their names, obviously, but the number one question that I get asked is where, from an institutional PM trader, etc. Where is that risk range? Like that's if there's if, if there's one thing that yeah, people yeah. want that I don't give them that they, if they could have it on their desktop every day, okay. where's the risk range? Okay. Right. So yeah, it, yeah, it's yeah. like it, we've done you know. Then there's a lot of competing technical products and whatnot. But I call that you know I, I call that very much old wall versus using a fractal dimensions, oh, yeah. using multi-factor models, uh, multi-duration models, obviously. And 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 I it, it's it's humbling to see so many people use it, but it's really. You know, they've said I'll outsource that to you as well. Yeah, is, yeah. is what would I say? Yeah. Okay. Well, um, you know, I forgot to mention like for people who want to ask some questions or if you'd like to receive the deck, if you just email us at info at cranshares .com, uh, as well as if you're joining us um, on cranshares .com, uh, if you're live streaming from our website, uh, there is a Q and A function. Uh, but again, if you're on the Zoom, please email us at info at cranshares.com or if you'd like to receive the presentation, we're happy to get that to you as well. Um, you know, one thing I got to ask, Keith, just uh, it's, it's been a while, two weeks. Um, I think one, one observation from a crane shares perspective that's different from a, a lot of asset managers is you know, we're, not, we're not focused on U.S. equities. 
Um, you know, we literally, you know, this is our first time that we had U.S. Equity. But we spent a lot of time talking to investors domestically, but also internationally. And I thought the one thing that has really stood out to me is, you know, how many people are overweight U.S. stocks and underweight a lot of foreign markets. And, you know, it certainly feels like there's a, you know, there's a whole host of reasons what's going on with the market. But, you know, I just think it'd be interesting. What's your take on this yen carry trade unwind? I mean, um, you know, this has been a trade, you know, you borrow in yen and you invest in other high yielding currencies or other risk assets. And all of a sudden that's ended. And uh, you know, certainly it's been a lot of headlines, but I'm just kind of curious your take on, uh, you know, applying the, the hedge eye you know, risk management framework to, you know, what's been a big time headline recently. Yeah, I mean, I, I wrote about that this morning, okay. actually. Uh, and um, there, there is, like this is, it's basically um, perpetuated by everything. It's never just one thing. Yeah, yeah. So when people say, like I, I said this morning, three quarters of my, con I built this contra stream on Twitter of you know, contrarian indicators and MSM and what I call old wall media. When three quarters of them are, are Japanese yen carry trading experts and none of them have ever traded the currency market itself, you, you know that we're in mm -hmm. a very loud narrative talking point. Yeah. You know, the US market, I call it uniquely American you know, uh, mania, but I mean, th they, they need it to be about one thing. What really happened yeah. was multiple things, right? Uh, not the least of which was Americans, bo the bond market, the stock market, and the currency market begging for like 10 rate cuts on a, on a Jobs Friday. So what happens when you, when, you, when you beg for rate cuts? You devalue the dollar. And the yen started going up faster because the dollar was going down. The dollar was going down because back-to-back -back negative economic data surprises you know, going back throughout the week. So that's what really kicked it into gear. Then Buffett comes in on the weekend and says, I sold half my Apple. Okay, well, that's a problem. Or was that the end carry trade? What happened there? Right. Was the U.S. employment report the end carry trade? No. Those are two pretty big things. It's the mm -hmm. biggest, it's the most widely held security in human history, Apple. And it's the U.S. dollar and U.S. interest rate expectations. Okay. Then the Japanese reiterate that we raised interest rates and we could do it again. So then it had its next leg up. What's interesting about all of it is that our signal, the risk range signal on the end, which we publish daily against the dollar, had been bearish for years. Like, I think two years, John could, John could tell you what the dates are. <laughs> um, but it, it was bearish trend, bearish yen, bullish dollar, for I think going back two years. Uh, in the middle of July, that signal flipped. The risk range has started to turn. So what happens when the risk range is turning is that the yen is no longer showing any more downside. Mm. And that was from a 38-year low. Yeah, That's a long time, right? So this thing was totally blown out, but all of a sudden the signal, the risk range is saying, hey, it's not going any lower than that anymore. No more lower lows. Then all of a sudden it's going up. So it went, it flipped a bullish trend on the yen in mid-July around 157 yen. Uh. And I didn't have to know Uchida or whoever's his guy's name that they're <laughs> yeah, talking about yeah. today or, you know, the, 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 the new Skeletor guy that got run in the Bank of Japan. I mean, I, 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 it, it doesn't, like, if you can open your mind to not having to know why all the time and trusting that the machine and the signal itself is way smarter than you're ever going to be, I'm talking to myself here, don't get offended, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> then, then, then you don't have to be everybody's expert on the end carry trade. But I think it was just, a, it was a, almost a perfect storm, Brennan, that it did include, and by the way, when we go back to the economic quads, we can show you on slide 35, we show every country. Uh, the reason why Japan raised interest rates is because their economy was accelerating, right? They were in quad one. Mm -hmm. So the whole thing was fundamentally set up to go the way that it was already going. Okay. And then, of course, I mean, the end carry trade has been going on for, for Many many years, yeah. right? It's just that it got you know, it, it flipped in terms of the signal. I, th I think Keith's also being very kind to you here because <laughs> I figured he was just going to say, I don't know about these narratives, but it's just the signal, and you know, bring that, <laughs> bring it back to you know how I utilize um, you know hedge eye for for this product. I mean, it's just the signal. I mean, put out there all the narratives you want, carry trade, whatever. Everyone's an expert, but you know, I mean, the signal front ran it, and we didn't have to know why. Yeah. So. You know, one of one of the questions actually we're getting, John, um, you know, related to uh, the case by index is, you know, how how will you adjust? Um, how will you know? It's really driven, I guess, by how the risk ranges adjust as the quads change. Like, um, you know, if we're in a quad one, more you know, bull, you know, bullish, 
you know, how, it, I guess it would just be like really where things are in terms of U.S. equities within the risk range yeah. determines what sort of strat option overlay is going Yeah, on. I mean, look, I think, you know, not to say it again, but Keith always says the signal front runs the quad. And I mean, look, you know, I think it's, 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 all, it's all priced in there constantly. It's, you know, whenever Keith is hitting that update, and I mean, you know, this is, this is his baby, so he can speak to it, but, you know, it's all in there. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the price volume volatility uh, model that produces the risk ranges, um, you know, it, it accounts for, you know, just by default, what, what, what quad we're in, what, what environment we're in, you know, what's going on in, in, mm -hmm. the, in the tape real time. What's interesting about that, that's, that's, the, that's the precise answer, um, is it when I'm getting something wrong, the risk ranges aren't getting it wrong. Mm. My position is wrong, yeah. right? The risk ranges are accurate. It's, I'm long something and it is now, I bought a dip, which was, I thought was the low end of the range, and it wasn't a dip. That means that it's not quad three where you, yeah. quad two or quad three where you buy tech or mag seven, and we did. Um, it's like, oh, that wasn't a dip. Now the low end of the range starts to break down, the trend breaks down the day or three, three four days after that, and then all of a sudden you're like, oh, it's quad four. Yeah. So and the you, risk range is always adjusting for yeah. that. Yeah, the risk range is always correct. My, um, the number one signal for me on any asset allocation, any position, the number one signal uh, that, that we're about to shift in, a, in terms of economic quads is that I'm losing money in the prior quad because we're not in it. Make sense? Yep. Yeah. Well, I know it makes sense to you. Well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I think, I think it's, uh, you know, it's, you know, you have, you're, you have a process that you've been doing for decades yeah. and, and you're trying to teach people how to incorporate that and, you know, you're up at the crack of dawn and, uh, you know, starting this process. And you know, I just think it's hard for, you know, uh, most people to really have that dedication, that consistency around, and then having a process. And I think that's what's exciting about, about the actual index and the, the ETF is it's incorporating all, all of that work into something that's investable. It's, it's actually doing something for you that'd be really hard to do yourself. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we've gotten some, uh, some good questions again. Uh, info at craneshares.com. If uh, you have a question you want to ask uh, Keith and John, uh, or you'd like to receive the deck, or if you're joining us on craneshares.com, just use the Q&A button. But uh, actually getting some questions um, uh, from actually overseas, uh, very specific. So you know, we, don't, we don't have uh, a USITS version of Case by today, uh, but that's something that we could you know, certainly uh, discuss. And please reach out to us if uh, you think there is demand for a, um, uh, a European listed version of this US listed ETF. So, so definitely a very specific question, but something that we'd be happy to entertain. Um, in terms of you know, your subscribers, Keith, on, on the research side, um, in terms of you know, you're, you're, you're applying risk ranges to a lot of different asset classes. Uh, what is it about that, the inputs, which are obviously proprietary, what, what is it that makes this risk range so compatible to various asset classes? If it's stocks or bonds or commodities, you're, you're, you're applying it to a lot of different uh, asset classes, but, but it, it still works, right? Yeah, 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 because it, <laughs> it's, ju it's just math. Okay. You know, like, so okay. if you look at the risk range of, um, of the 10-year U.S. Treasury bond, it's generally going to be much narrower than that of the S&P 500 because the beta and the volatility is much lower. So it just accepts volatility on a realized basis for what it is, mm -hmm. and it interprets the probability of where volatility could be relative to the price and the volume mm -hmm. in the future state. So what I think is, again, I think it's been perpetuated by a lot of institutional investors using our signal. I think it's been perpetuated by the machine itself. There's a, an unprecedented level of options positioning uh, and leverage in, in the U.S. system, mm. in particular in the S&P 500, um, and, 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 and there's a constant whip to it. You know, like if you think uh, about the machine, like it, it is constantly looking for that spot to suck the most amount of people in <laughs> when it blows you out. I mean, that's yeah. the, and, and our, our process is actually built to, to, to risk manage that. Yeah. Like I said, everything that I built has to do with rule number one from Warren Buffett, which I, and, and Charlie Munger, and I wish, you know, I wish the whole world just kind of didn't leave that. Which is rule number one: don't lose money, right? So I needed a signal to not be that person. I call them the uninformed volume. Mm. 
You're, if, you were buy, if you bought yesterday's intraday high of the S&P 500 on 530 SPY, you were the uh, uninformed volume, right? If you, if, you know, th th there are many, many times where this comes into play. So, you know, for me, um, there's a lot, a lot of reasons why it's working. Um, and until it stops working, I'm going to keep using it. Yeah, yeah. Well, the track record, you know, to yeah. your point, to John, you showed that great slide of, you know, 83% of... Uh, yeah, 83% of the time, uh, the S&P 500 closes within its daily published risk yeah, range. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, Keith's been since the 90s, right? You've been producing the risk ranges? <laughs> well, not the, not the, I mean, I've been in the business, now you're dating me since oh. the 90s. <laughs> but, but the, yeah. Trying to give some, uh, some historical context. But, but, but the, 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 the tool um, that we're talking about here, the risk range for, for the S&P 500 specifically, I mean, it's constantly being refined. Right. Yeah. Constantly. Yeah. Like we have, uh, any edge I can have mathematically in, in terms of getting it a little bit more accurate, that's been happening for many, many years, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. And I think today, like, even if I go back to when we started Hedgeye, you know, I had my Bloomberg machine, I had options data, you know, vol data, et cetera, but it would take so long just to download it into a, mm -hmm. a basic Excel spreadsheet. Like now, you, everything just snaps. Like I can get everything in real time. All the data, everything flows. Um, we're using some AI techniques, you know, um, but it, it's, it, the, the, the thing's smart and it's getting smarter. Just kind of a refining the process, yeah. you know. It's yeah. very, yeah, interesting. It's, it's, it's. I often say it's like, um, you, know, you can, you can have the most modern architecture of a fighter jet, but you do need somebody to fly it. Okay, you need somebody to understand mm -hmm. when to throttle. You know, we always call it the throttle to the toggle. But I mean, you, you, you. I, I've, for better or worse, this has been like that's why my hair's gone white. Uh, <laughs> this is what I have to do every day. <laughs> it's my job. <laughs> Well, another interest is, uh, you know, a fighter jet isn't built to fly in stormy weather. <laughs> you know, like they're so fragile, right? You know, it's this uh, supercar and uh, it's, um, you know, it's actually not built. You know, it, it can do a lot of things, but in the wrong environment, it's, it's actually the wrong tool. Mm. And that's kind of like how I, you know, again, you know, I, I just take my own personal situation of like, you know, I've been a huge beneficiary personally of, you know, great, incredible bull market. I, I didn't do a lot of work. <laughs> you know, I just kind of sat there, invested. Um, I think that's kind of part of what, you know, is a little bit of a concern that there's a lot of people in retirement who, you know, you know they've enjoyed this incredible bull market run. But, but you know, if things do change, and we can't, we can't necessarily predict the future of exactly what's going to happen, and we're not, we're not preaching doom and gloom by any means. It's more of, I just go back to risk managed strategies like a case buy, I think are going to come back in the vogue just because that underlying economic environment, the underpinnings for this environment are arguably changing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, besides, you know, things like the yen, but, but, you know, we've got an election and, you know, what do, what do, how do taxes change? You know, how do economic policy, you know, you know, there's, there's, and then that's where it's almost impossible. And I think to say like, Oh, like, you know, look, you know, just that's where the math comes in here. Yeah. I, I mean, people always, uh, well, people will eventually and always want and need risk management because they lose money, right? right? So S and P goes down eight percent. Now I want a risk management product. Um, but the, the 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 idea here is that it you don't have to just think of it in a negative way, right? Like you know, risk managing something going up too fast and not being that uninformed volume buying it up there. That's every bit the risk management decision that you know that it is you know, going or trying to risk manage the downside. I mean, I, I, I think, and the other thing I'd say about it is, since risk management always comes back in vogue, um, there, there really aren't many, like we've looked at the competing products. I mean, we've looked at, if you look at, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, <laughs> we're, yeah, like, a, the, there's I, a myriad. we there's run 3,000 ETFs through our daily process. 3,000, right? And it's growing, that number. Every day it grows. Uh, it's almost 3,000, I think, right now. And, you know, there aren't there. You may want risk. We may have wanted risk management in two thousand and eight, but there's there wasn't an ETF to help you with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, there, you may have wanted it and needed it in twenty twenty two, coming off the economic cycle high when Quad Four hit in twenty twenty two. Nobody had that view other than Hedge Eye, uh, but there there was no. You know, I know a, a collection of ETFs that I can buy for that environment that'll do better than Spy, but there's no. There was no, like there was no. There there are no. You know, Nancy Davis has a very sophisticated 
uh, I, you know, ETF that, that, you know, for example, that's built by, yeah. by somebody who's like actually looking at the underlyings and, and the options. But um, I don't think there's a lot. Yeah. Because a lot of these things that I look at, I think that compete with K-SPY are more like um, they're, they're closed end or... Yeah, I mean, they have their own nuances. Um, and, you know, I think we went through, I mean, you know, kind of the differentiation between um, you know our product and 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 you know kind of the mm -hmm. the incumbent products that are out there um, and obviously you know uh, those those high um, conviction uh, occurrences uh, you know above the top end of the risk range and below the low end of the risk ranges you know I think where we we will really see differentiation mm -hmm. in the index and you know where we um, you know would expect to to really separate ourselves from the incumbent yeah. players. I mean, you, I mean, it's kind of a non-math question, which I know you hate. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I mean, are, are we are we that far away from, you know, uh, you know, 08? You know, you know, one one of one of the things we've tried, you know, you know one of our core theses is that um, that the next decade might not look like the last decade, mm -hmm. um, and just just you know, S and P five hundred, you know, up almost it hit a thousand percent, but you know. All country world XUS, not even one third of that. Not not even one third. So you know, um, e MSCI EM, I think it was about two fifty. Um, you know, a fraction of the U.S. Um, you know, I've had the pleasure of visiting Santiago, Chile, a beautiful city and country. MSCI Chile is up fifty percent over the last fifty years. I mean, just it's just you have this huge and and do you think just people have kind of forgotten? I mean, is an 08 or even a 99? Is is it so far in the rear view mirror that that you have this kind of full risk on mentality? You know, um, I mean that. I mean, I, again, it's not a very mathematical ten rate question. Cuts? Yeah, I know. I, ten I know. rate cuts? No, I, I, it's it's still it's it's still. I mean, the reason why I like mathematical questions more because they're easier to answer. Hey. <laughs> it's just a quick answer. That's the end. That's where the range is. Um, but in this regard, I mean, I, I think of like, if I think of our own process, like the amount of people that miss being long India. Now, India, for example, since we bought it in the summer of last year is up 33%. I think the S&P is like up 20, maybe yeah, less yeah. than that. You know, so there, there have been places that all of a sudden, that's the one, number one, right? I'm picking the number one. But again, it fits the profile of what we said. If you go back to that slide 35, you can see that, you know, we have India's GDP going to 7%. If USA's GDP is slowing towards one, one and a half percent, and India is going to seven, yeah. then, and you want to own growth, the growth that nobody else owns, it's been India. Yeah, yeah. So I think to your point, mm -hmm. if you don't, if your economy doesn't grow, I don't know, uh, Chile is not on my front end radar for, for this question, but, <laughs> yeah. but, but no, I could, we, we can model Chile, um, but it's, it's not going to do well when copper's crashing, you know, so because they have such you know, an ex a huge exposure there inside of the ETF. Uh, that I have looked at, but um, and I can't get back to you on it. But but I think I think you're right. I think that there's a relative moment in time. There's also the huge relative moment, you know, relative to, to alternatives like the entire fixed income market, gold, which you know, on our model is signaling all time highs. Which gold could go to three or four thousand. I mean, there's so many different things that people don't own that are actually working all of a sudden mm -hmm. that weren't working when people are chasing Mag Seven. Yeah. So I think that if you like, I call it the mother of all bubbles, and I was long it. Can you, can you handle that? Right? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. If it wasn't a bubble, it wouldn't be going up. I mean, when NVIDIA uh, peaked and, and, and when the MAG-7 peaked, that was, there, is, there is unprecedented in, in almost everything mm -hmm. that is the S&P 500. Mm -hmm. You know, the concentration of the MAG-7 relative yep. to, the, to the rest. Yeah. You know, the, the multiples embedded they're in. And most importantly, the economic tailwind that these companies had, which was an economy that was not slowing into quad four. These economy, you know, the economy was accelerating. And when the economy is accelerating, there's no price that you can't pay for NVIDIA. I watched NVIDIA, for example, yesterday, when it turn tailed intraday, people are, ch there's a bubbles everywhere, Brendan. Weekly YOLO call options, over 180,000 NVIDIA on the 110 strike traded. Mm -hmm. 110,000, buy one at home and tell me how much that costs, all right? <laughs> now, this is a turn into a, a mania. Yeah. And what happened was it turn tailed, it closed down at 98. All those, you know, the, these are weekly options that have to close at 110 by yeah, yeah. tomorrow. Um, they're just worth nothing. Yeah. But for a while, you know, and, and the stock traded 409 million shares. 409 million shares on a $100 stock. Do the math. 
there's an unbelievable bubble in terms of the actual girth of it, right? And again, the only catalyst for it to go down is quad four. Yeah, and then, you know, Nick, if you show slide 18, we actually uh, um, show just how, how overweight, and something that you, you know, I know your hedge eye research team's been talking a lot about, just the <laughs> concentration of, of the returns. And yeah, it's, um, you know, just, yeah, I mean, some of the, some of the things I, it, I've seen, it, it's almost like someone keeps, it's like they're at the roulette table and they keep just betting black being <laughs> like, it's, if I keep, just keep betting black, red's got to come up. Mm -hmm. But but each flip of the coin, you know, every flip is independent of one another. <laughs> you know, so, you know, I, I think I actually, I, I looked for you, I think the longest streak for a single color is like in the 1860s was something like <laughs> a thousand. You know, it's like mathematically impossible. But um, yeah, some of the things I think around uh, um, activity in some of the Mag 7 plays, it just, it just feels like, yeah. you know, just, yeah, it's and, a you know, disconcerting. For, for, for us, my, your feeling about that, all your experience with that, uh, is either confirmed or denied by the risk range of NVIDIA, by the risk range of the MAG-7, and therefore the risk range of the S&P 500. If those things aren't signaling higher highs, and they're signaling lower highs on a, what we call an intermediate term trend breakdown in quad four, that's an easy answer for me to see. I could believe anything that you could tell. We don't have to have 2008, we don't have to have 2000, we can have 2024. And 2024, to your point, has concentration risks like no major equity market has ever had. Yeah, yeah, and it could be interesting. I think that's um, you know if the other 493 kind of come back a bit, right? Yep. You know where, where you know the S and P could still have a good year, just maybe these seven kind of lag or. Um, and that was one question we got. You know, John, I think from uh, from David was just you know in terms of a trending U.S. equity. Um, you know, ha are you giving up a lot of upside with this strategy? Or is it, it's, you know, how, how should some think about it, but this kind of idea of a risk adjusted, you know, you know I'm not giving away all my upside. Yeah, I, I mean, look, I think, you know, the answer, everybody wants to know exactly what this thing's gonna do on a day-to-day -day <laughs> yeah. basis. And, and the answer is, you know, we don't know until we get the risk range. Um, so, you know, I think handicapping, you know, uh, what, how much upside you're going to give away or not is is somewhat difficult, but I will, you know, just always I, I will say that, you know, based on the way that we've structured the the index, um, you know, we do think, um, you know, that it's set up in a manner, um, you know, we're using three week out options, which is, uh, you know, based upon Keith's uh, immediate trade with three weeks or less, um, you know, risk ranges, uh, and you know. Uh, not holding options within the same week mm -hmm. they expire. So, you know, there is enough movement, uh, at least in our opinion, uh, on these options within the index that, you know, it allows for, you know, fluctuations to the upside mm -hmm. um, and, you know, capture. And I guess, you know, just you just take the same question, put it in reverse and just be like, hey, look at look at exactly how we've done. Like we're not we're not immune to the market coming down, but we've certainly mitigated an element of that. And I think that's that's where, you know, you know, just based on where we are, you know, you know, we haven't had some, you know, catastrophic meltdown, but, but, you know, we're, you know, we've got, you know, potentially some, some risk management, you know, just in case. Right? Yeah. And it also depends on, you know, the way that the index is adjusting itself. I know, you know, anybody can look back at, um, you know, what the, the product has done, uh, the index has done, um, you know, so far. Um, and, you know, you can see based on, you know, some changes that were made, you know, during the day, based on the methodology of the index, you know, we were able to capture additional, um, you know, performance that we may not have otherwise been able to. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Well, I know we're we're coming up on the hour, and uh, we definitely want to be conscious of everyone's time. So, yeah, I think the key is you know, you wake up tomorrow, you have some more questions, uh, you want to receive the deck. Just please email us at info at craneshares.com. Certainly, we want to learn more about hedge eye risk management and the, the great work they do. You know, certainly uh, just email us and we can, you know, pass that, I guess, pass that along. We'll figure that out. Uh, or just certainly just go to Hedge Eye's website. Again, you know, I've spent a lot of time on there. You're, you're very generous in giving away some great educational materials about your process. Uh, but again, you know, thank you so much. Uh, great to introduce Case by to you. And uh, certainly, please, again, please reach out to us. You wake up tomorrow, anytime. Further questions, info at craneshares.com.